Hello and welcome to Franklin Covey's On Leadership series. My name is Scott Miller and I serve as your weekly host and interviewer. Now each week, we do our best to bring to you great visionaries, leaders, CEOs, thought leaders, book authors, people with amazing stories, practical experience and insight about this topic we're all consumed with these days called leadership. And today is no different and does not disappoint. I am humbly honored to be in the presence with today's guest, the renowned author, military leader, General Stanley McChrystal. General, welcome to On Leadership. Thanks for having me, Scott. What an honor. First, on behalf of our millions of viewers and subscribers, we want you to know how respectful and appreciative we are to your service, to our nation, and to all those who you've led and who are still in service. So thank you so humbly for your contribution to not just Americans' democracy, but really continued stability and peace around the world. Well, you're kind, and I'll spread that to all the other people I was honored to, to be alongside. I appreciate that, General. We have a half an hour or so together today, so we're delighted to have you here. We're going to talk about your newest book, Leadership. Before we start with that, we'd like to talk about your own journey. For those who may not be aware of the leadership lessons you've learned around your career, would you take a couple of minutes and talk about your military career and what you've been doing since that in the private sector? Sure, thanks. I, I grew up in an Army family. My father was a soldier, and my father's father was a soldier, and my brothers were soldiers. My sister married a soldier, so, so you, you sort of get it. And for my whole life, I wanted to be a soldier. I wanted to be my father. So at age 17, I went to West Point, where I was exposed to as much as they could teach about leadership. And I love history, so I, I really enjoyed that part of it. Uh, I became a young officer in the mid-1970s. I graduated in 1976, and that was a troubled time for the military. We were coming out of Vietnam. Leadership was at least confused and in many ways damaged with integrity issues and whatnot, and drug use in the military. And so I was lucky enough to be part of a journey in which the United States Army, starting in that late 70s, repaired itself and took itself into a new sort of generation of leading. And, and much of that was very, very good, but it was very instructive to be part of that. I began as a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, and then I went to Special Forces, I was a Green Beret Lieutenant, and then had a series of assignments from Korea and a mech unit, then went to the Ranger Regiment in the uh, mid 1980s, and that sort of shaped the rest of my career. The Rangers are an elite special operations infantry force that I ultimately had several uh, assignments in and commanded the regiment in the late 1990s. And, and by the end of that, I had developed this incredible love for the army, but this incredible love for the soldiers and particularly the sergeants that I served alongside. And I became very dependent upon this group of professionals that molds the leaders that they work with and work for. And so if there's anyone I owe the major debt to, it's the, the non-commissioned officers of the Rangers and other forces that, that helped shape me. I went on and, and had a couple other assignments back in the 82nd again. And then I ended up in, after 9-11 in Afghanistan, for the first, uh, my first deployment there. And I was uh, a few months after the initial invasion and I saw the challenge that Afghanistan was gonna be. Only stayed a few months then and then came back. And then in the fall of 2003, I took over an organization called JSOC or Joint Special Operations Command. And that's America's counter-terrorist forces put into a single task force, that's Delta Force, SEAL Team Six, the Rangers, all been together in this extraordinarily elite organization. And I'd been in it for much of my career before as a component force, but then I was the named commanding general in 2003, and that's different when you're in charge. So I spent the next five years commanding that organization. I was uh, replaced by Bill McRaven, who was my deputy by, for much of that. So I was alongside these larger than life heroes, and I watched this organization not only fight an incredibly tough fight in Iraq and in, across the broader Middle East against Al Qaeda in Iraq and wider Al Qaeda, but I also watched the organization transform itself. I, was, I got to be a part of this transformation when an organization had to transform to entirely new conditions under great pressure. And by being part of that, it really transformed how I think about leadership. 
You know, General, you mentioned the service in the Army. I want to make a call out. One of Franklin Covey's senior consultants, Dr. Patrick Ledden, who's one of our esteemed members for nearly 20 years here, was a former Army Ranger. He's gone on to write several books for us as an author of a future book, and so we're privileged to have one of your um, comrades here at Franklin Covey as well. Well, you should, I mean, you, you should really give great uh, credit to him because those guys who have been in the Rangers have just given so much. Yeah, he's a great friend of ours. Uh, so you've written this amazing book, which is one of several on our wall of fame. You can see in our studio here, we've picked our favorite books, and many of yours have a place of honor here. But you've written this book, Leaders, Myths and Reality. We're going to talk about it in a few moments here, but you actually based it loosely in the format of this beauty, <laughs> Plutarch's Lives. And the odds of me finishing this book are probably less than they are of you becoming the US president. In fact, I might try to finish it in time for your inauguration. But this famous book is really a compilation of I think maybe uh, nearly 40 different leaders in history, maybe 48 or so, people like you know Percoles and Romulus and such. And your book kind of modernizes that format. You took some of the genius that is this thousand page book, you can see still in its pristine format. <laughs> uh, I'll suffer through it. But you took, I think, um, uh, six pairs. So you, you focus on 12 leaders plus one, General Lee, and they base the form of your book. Talk about why you picked those 12 plus one, and why did you not match General Lee with the other 12? Sure. First off, we chose Plutarch because Plutarch was really the first biographer. And although most of us in modern society haven't read Plutarch, uh, 50 or 100 years ago, we all would have, educated people would have. But, but he still affects us because he's one of the reasons why we look at leadership through this spotlight on leaders. We tend to say that the leader is the reason an organization succeeds or fails, and a leader is sort of central to the play. Uh, and so biography became very important. We wanted to look at leadership in this book, this new book, but we knew that to do that, an important way to do it was to look at leaders. And that's because one, we're used to reading about leaders, we're interested in reading about leaders, and we could give a, a broad facet. So we didn't want to do 48 as Plutarch had done, we thought we would do 12. And we came out with six pairings in genres. So for example, we wanted to pick leaders who were geniuses. And we picked Albert Einstein and Leonard Bernstein. Not formal leaders, but clearly had a great leadership role. We picked heroes. We picked the uh, Chinese Admiral Zhang Ha in the 15th century. Not many of us know about him, but he's a huge figure in China today. And we paired him with Harriet Tubman, a five foot tall African-American female who was an escaped slave who went back into slave controlled territory 13 times before the Civil War to lead other slaves to freedom, and then became an iconic leader of the movement against slavery for the remainder of his life, her life. We looked at power brokers. We started with politicians, and we said, well, power brokers was a better comparison. And we went with Boss Tweed of New York City, the, the famously corrupt leader in Tammany Hall. And we paired him with Margaret Thatcher, the grocer's daughter, who became for 11 years this iconic prime minister against all odds in 1970s and 80s uh, Great Britain. We also wanted to look at reformers. So we looked at Martin Luther of the Protestant Reformation and paired him with Martin Luther King Jr., who had been a hero of mine, and, and how people who are part of a church can start a reformation and what that really implies. And then another interesting one for me was founders. And we looked at Walt Disney, who founded, of course, the empire that was so big when I was young. And we paired him with Coco Chanel, who founded, of course, a fashion empire. And, and I admit to people, I didn't know she was even a person when we started this book. But she's this amazing orphan from rural France who sees an opportunity around the time of the First World War to fundamentally change fashion. And she becomes this living embodiment of a new lifestyle for females and with her fashion and her fragrance carries it forward. We ended up with all of these leaders, uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't mention the zealots. We also looked right. at people who lead with this passion and we put Robespierre with Abu Musab al-Zarqawi of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And they both were people who had this unwavering commitment and, and sort of magnetically draws us to them. 
And then the final one was the one off was Robert E. Lee. You mentioned this, Scott. Robert E. Lee was originally going to be looked at as a hero, not from the standpoint of whether they really were a hero, but those were people who get put on a pedestal by society, almost like an icon as opposed to a real person. And we were going to pair him with Harriet Tubman. And then we realized with Charlottesville and all, it was just going to be too awkward to be too many uh, things that caused people not to read them with an open mind. So right. we separated Lee because I thought we had to have Lee because I'd grown up with Robert E. Lee. I grew up near his home. I'd gone to West Point as he had. I, I went to Washington Lee High School. Um, so as a consequence, he'd been a figure through my, my entire career that I wanted to emulate. But as we got further in my life, as I studied him further, and particularly after Charlottesville in the spring of 2017, my perspective evolved. And, and that was an important reason that I thought that we also write about it. General, speaking of Lee, you share a, a very endearing and maybe even conflicting story about uh, uh, unceremoniously taking down this, this, this photo in your house. Will you share that story with the viewers today? God, I sure will. Um, when I was a second lieutenant, my wife knew that I revered Robert E. Lee. And in addition to all the other connections, I'd lived in Lee Barracks at West Point. And so when I was, uh, when we were just married, she spent $25 and bought me a painting of Robert E. Lee in his Confederate Army uniform. It wasn't even a real painting. It was a print of an old painting that had been painted over with clear acrylic to give it brush strokes and look like a painting. But for 40 years, I hung it in every set of quarters, wherever we lived. And I was very proud of it because it reminded me of leadership, but it also symbolized to the people who were visiting me what, you know, I thought about leadership and who my heroes were. Then in the spring of 2017, after Charlottesville, my wife said, I think you ought to take that down. And I really was hesitant because it meant a lot. My first argument back to her was, I can't take it down, honey, you gave it to me. And we'd been married 41 years. And she said, no, nah, I got that forget it. You need to take it down. And, and she said, I don't think it means what you think it does. And I said, it means just leadership. He wasn't political. He was just a leader. And she said, well, it may mean that to you, but to people in our home, it may mean unconsciously that you're trying to communicate. You agree with white supremacy and things that groups that have hijacked Lee's memory. I took about a month of discussions with her. And then I realized she was right. And at age 63, one Sunday morning, I went to my office, took the picture down, took it out to our garbage and put it out for pickup the next day. And it went to the landfill. And it was a difficult decision because I still respect much about Robert E. Lee. He was this incredibly courteous, courageous, decisive, almost prototypically perfect military leader. And I can admire that. I mean, I almost reflexively do. But at the same time, in the spring of 1861, he raised his hand, or excuse me, he broke the oath that he had made to West Point, at West Point, to the United States, and he had served the U.S. Army for 32 years faithfully. He broke his oath and decided to go against his nation. In fact, spend the next four years trying to divide the United States of America. And he did it in defense of slavery. Now, People say, well, you know, you got to put context to the times, and I do all of that. Um, and people say, you got to be able to forgive him. Well, it's not my place to forgive him. I still admire much about Robert E. Lee, but I cannot forget that he made a decision that, that I think is unsupportable. It's indefensible. And so as a consequence for me, Robert E. Lee is now not a statue or a two-dimensional perfect hero. He's a human being. Much about him I still admire, much about him I'd love to be able to emulate, but parts about him I don't, and parts about him I don't want to be. What he's become as a human being, he's become flawed. He's become like me, like all of us. General, I appreciate your vulnerability in sharing that story because I wrestled with it. I read the passage four or five times in your book and thought about you know, were you abandoning one of your heroes or were you just modeling, I think, a leadership principle with being relevant to the times and really kind of examining your own conscience as well? So I pay you tribute for that. I appreciate you sharing that story, not just with today, but in your book as well. 
where you're kind, Scott. It, it, those are tough. And, you know, you worry about, am I just blowing with the winds of fashion right now? But when I thought and studied this more, and it took a year to write that one profile because I kept going and thinking about it and going back to it, uh, knowing that people would all react differently. But I think, I think it was an important journey for me to take. General, as you can see, I read a lot of books in the course of this job. Your, your book is a masterpiece. It is, uh, it's probably a required history book, like a required leadership history book for every high school, college student. You open it by kind of debunking some of the myths around how people view leaders as being very stoic and almost infallible. Would you share the two stories around uh, Caesar and kind of the truth around Caesar's ending, and then would you expand a bit on the, the painting and picture around Washington crossing the Delaware? I think it's two profound lenses with which you, 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 you challenge the myth around how we tend to see leaders you know, larger than themselves, which isn't really fair or accurate. No, that's right, and, and it's great that you say fair because it's, it's unfair to put them on a pedestal that no one can stay on. Uh, Julius Caesar was great because if you if you sort of get a short synopsis, you say he got to the ed, the banks of the Rubicon and then he decisively crossed the Rubicon with the 13th Legion, marched on Rome, became the leader, you know, the, the dictator for life of Rome. And then ultimately he's murdered by his duplicitous former or uh, former colleagues and he dies sort of bravely going et tu brute. The reality is when he got to the banks of the Rubicon, it was like a creek. So crossing the Rubicon meant you get your feet wet, maybe your ankles, and that's it. And second, instead of decisively crossing it, he actually stopped at the near side and did a fair amount of hand wringing, should I, shouldn't I? And so as a consequence, instead of looking like completely decisive, he looks like you and I would be. He looks like he's got second thoughts. This is a big deal. And then when he is murdered, instead of you know, bravely burying his chest and, and taking the knives of the other senators, he fights and it turns out to be this sort of confused melee in which they end up cutting each other with knives. Uh, so it, it's not quite as heroic as, as it might be. It's probably much more realistic. Similarly, we think of Washington crossing the Delaware. And, you know, I, there's that famous picture of Washington and in almost a rowboat looking thing with some people rowing. And he's standing up and leaning forward over this ice filled river crossing the Delaware to get at the British. And a copy of that picture hangs in the White House. And as people go through it, they see it. And most people look at it and they go, okay, well, there's brave General Washington going across the Delaware. Well, if you go with his story and the historian points out numbers of things about it that, that aren't accurate, but the most should be obvious to us. Here's a pretty smart guy, a big guy, standing up in an ice-filled river at night in this tiny boat. He could fall out, he could tip the boat. Nobody's gonna tolerate that, it's absurd. But, but we don't doubt that because we just sort of allow the idea, the mythology of leaders to do that. They had a more realistic painting painted and it's a flat bottom barge boat and it shows Washington still on the boat but now he's holding on to a cannon for his stability, which is exactly what any rational uh, person crossing an ice-filled river would do, particularly a veteran soldier. But the fact that we're willing to accept these myths almost without questioning says an awful lot about us because really the great takeaway of this book is that we look at leaders through these myths, but at the end of the day, it says much of us as followers, we have a much greater responsibility in the leadership process than we sometimes admit. We're responsible clearly for selecting, electing, supporting, following, empowering leaders, helping guide them. But in many cases, we don't do that. Many cases we say, well, we'll just stand here and wait for the next man on horseback or great woman to come along and, and we will sort of sheepishly follow. And that's not our role. Uh, I love the metaphor of watching General Washington kind of hold on to the cannon because it humanizes him and makes us all realize that no matter what level of leadership you're in, from the C-suite down to perhaps a first level leader, there are times of uncertainty 
and you don't have all the answers and great leaders surround themselves with competent people who may well be smarter than they are in certain areas. And I think the, the more truer picture of Washington was, even though he was a great leader, he had doubts and he was very, um, very fallible, like all of us. Exactly. And if you're not surrounded by people who are smarter than you, then you're not that smart a leader. <laughs> well yeah. said. General, you mentioned you organized the book kind of in six sections, and you titled them The Founders, The Geniuses, The Zealots, The Heroes, The Power Brokers, and The Reformers. In the opening section, you talk about the founders, and you feature both Walt Disney and Coco Chanel. Would you share briefly what you learned about both of those people during the multi-year process of writing this book? Sure. And this is an age in when we celebrate founders uh, quite a lot. And Founders are people who, who create something from whole cloth. And in the case, in, for example, of Walt Disney, he had tremendous talent as an animator and even more as an innovator. He, he took early stages of animated shorts and the creation of uh, Mickey Mouse with Steamboat Willie, but he also did a number of technological advances on animated uh, film. But then of course, in 1934, he does this extraordinary thing. He gives all of his employees 50 cents for dinner. And then he tells them to come back to work after dinner. And he gets them in an auditorium. And for the next three hours, he gets on the stage and by himself acts out every part in an old German folk tale. He says, we are gonna make a full length animated movie of this folk tale. They're mesmerized. And of course they are motivated by a person who could have this belief. Now you see a full length animated movie, so what? This was the first. It was a huge financial gamble. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was trying to go somewhere that no movie like it had ever done. And people didn't think it would commercially work, but he mortgaged the company, he mortgaged the intellectual property to Mickey Mouse itself, mortgaged his home. And in 1937, after three years of really intensive work, they released the movie and of course it's hugely successful. And he drives it, he is fanatical on attention to detail. In one point, in one of the reviews of film that they had, Dopey, the last of, in line of the uh, dwarfs, does a hitch step walking. Walt Disney sees it, loves it, and he says, every time Dopey walks into the room, I wanna see the hitch step. That took him six months to go back and edit into what they already had. So it was that kind of demand. But here he is, incredibly successful, he and the team in 1937 with the rollout of Snow White. They've gone through the depression, they've created this company that's now a rising empire. And But by 1941, he has a bitter strike by his animators against him. The person who founded it, the person who'd given them jobs, the person who'd created opportunity. And what had happened was we see that this, this talented animator, this talented visionary, wasn't a very good manager when his company got bigger. He struggled with being able to do that. As a consequence, he goes through all of the challenges that someone who's not a very good leader at a big, at a large level does. And that also, to me, makes him intensely human. And how about Coco Chanel? But I love that I'm having a conversation with a general. We're talking about Dopey and Coco Chanel. What, what are some of your favorite uh, learnings from uncovering Coco Chanel's leadership journey? Yeah, um, you're right. Who would have predicted you and I have a Coco <laughs> Chanel? I'm kind of proud in, in a way, but yeah. some of my former cat, comrades are probably looking at me with askance. But, um, you know, Coco Chanel was a great leader. Now, here's the thing. She, she starts, of course, as a, a uh, orphan with nothing. She learns to sew, she does nightclub singing, and she becomes connected to some army officers who essentially, for whom she becomes a courtesan. And uh, that was not looked down as much then as it might be now. But she is very opportunistic, not in a negative way, but in a positive way. She sees that women's fashions are heavy on the eve of the First World War. They're expensive, they're hot, they're constricting. And this is an age when women are starting to get into the workforce. Also, with the rise of the First World War, you need more women in the workforce, and you also need to cut costs on clothing. She sees a series of things intersecting, and she says, let's create an entirely different way of dressing, lighter, freer, more uh, 
more akin to the body type that she had. She was very slim, athletic looking. And so she creates this using new fabric. She creates it. But to sell it, she creates a lifestyle. And the lifestyle, she centers around Coco herself. So she lives this lifestyle. She epitomizes by how she dresses, how she lives. And she invites women to come be Coco Chanel. And to do that, wear my fashions and ultimately use my fragrance. And it, it's wildly successful. She also turns out to be a very good business person. Although she, she gives up much business control of the Chanel empire, she keeps creative control, which is key. And, and she has her own hiccups. She has, during the Second World War, she stays in Paris and establishes a long-term romance with a German military officer. She gets involved in some intelligence things she shouldn't have. And so she is essentially forced to leave France for more than a decade. And she's persona non grata. But then she comes back in the 50s. At first, people are somewhat hesitant about her fashion coming back. But then, of course, they embrace her again. And she reignites the empire and goes forward. And, of course, it's, it's healthy to this day. She was tough lady. She was great at marketing, great at business, but really tough to work for demanding. She had women stand like human mannequins for hours while she adjusted fashions on their body, while she's chain smoking cigarettes out of the corner of her mouth. But she never had trouble getting people to work for her because as, as followers, as participants, we want to be part of something special. We want to follow a leader who's a visionary, who is magnetic, who is driven, and we're willing to, to put up with an awful lot for that experience. General, you also feature another great female leader, Margaret Thatcher, in the Power Broker section. In fact, one of my personal heroes so much, I actually named my oldest son Thatcher after Margaret Thatcher. And he loves the fact that he's named for this amazing leader his dad so admires. You know, but Margaret Thatcher was a bit unilateral. This was not a consensus seeker. She was quite dogmatic in her opinions. And if you look at her leadership journey, it kind of follows a bit of a traditional bell curve, right? Including her ending. Why did you choose to include Margaret Thatcher and what did you learn about her in your research? Now, Scott, that's great. That, we chose her for almost the reasons you laid out. We wanted a political leader who dealt in power, a very practical set of experiences. Margaret Thatcher was an unlikely rise. She, she came up right at the end of the Second World War. Her hero was Winston Churchill. She was conservative by nature as her father had been. But that was an era when Britain, coming out of World War II, theoretically as the victor, was actually arguably a loser, economically a loser. The, the uh, empire was fading away very quickly. And for the early years of her political career, she could just see Britain, the idea of Great Britain, constantly deteriorating. And people were almost scoffing at it. And internal in Britain, there was a great move to strong unions and socialism, and there was economic malaise. She reacted differently than some. She said, no, Great Britain will be great again. We are still great. We will be great again. It resonates, as we know. But, but she, she harkened back to the ideas of Winston Churchill, and she said, we must be forthright. We must be steadfast. We must push. At one point, as she started to implement policies, someone said, well, we should turn. And she famously said, this lady's not for turning. So even when it was tough, when she got into rising into power, she was unwilling to compromise. We describe her as a pol politician or a person of conviction. People were attracted to someone who wouldn't waver. When you got to the bank of the river, they wouldn't go, ah, should we go across? They would say, we are going across. And from that, we take confidence. Now, as, as Prime Minister Thatcher, a female making it to the prime minister job, was incredibly unlikely, but she did it, and she did it by being a great politician. When she got into office, she was able to push a number of policies. She was, uh, she benefited tremendously from the Falklands War, the timing of it, and her being strong during that period. And she created this 11-year period in which her leadership was dominant in Britain. But as you mentioned, the bell curve, as she led, she was also a pretty autocratic leader in a, in a, uh, around her personal leadership. It was, it was a bit her way of the highway. And that's good for people, but it wears on them. And over time, what, what you saw was 
her own internal leaders started to tire of that. And so in the last few years, she had less and less uh, stability in her support. And finally, she's, she's done in politically by her own allies who assassinate her, in, to use the term politically, uh, after her time had run. But that's pretty common. There is a certain half-life to a political leader in most cases. And what we look for initially, we often tire of. General, you had an amazing career. Uh, with the launch of this book, you're now a, a multi-best-selling uh, author. This book's been on the, the best-selling list now for nearly a month. And your name is bantered around as, you know, being one of the greatest leaders our country has, even a candidate to be the president. A as you look at the future of leadership, what are the leadership qualities you look for in your own leaders, whether they're, you know, again, frontline leaders, mid-level leaders, CEOs, the president of the U.S., prime minister, uh, you've had an amazing journey. Uh, rattle off some of the leadership traits you most value as you're beginning to be really a voice in the forefront of reshaping the conversation around what leadership looks like. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I, I think that we have a crisis of leadership in America, and I think it is our fault. Um, I think that what we've done is we've confused celebrity for leadership. I think sometimes we've been uh, confuse success in a certain endeavor, any, you name it, business or whatever with leadership. Um, what we've really got to do is look in the mirror. We individually have got to look in the mirror and decide what we want to be as Americans. Then we've got to look sort of in the collective mirror and decide what we want our nation to be. What are the values we want? What are the, the ways we want to be viewed by the rest of the world? And how do we want our grandchildren to view us? Then we need to decide, okay, what kind of leader do we need to lead the nation? I would start first by saying, I'm not sure we should elect a president anymore because I think we're confusing leadership with a single person. I don't think the presidency really lends itself to any single person doing it. I think you're really electing a team. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to have to elect somebody for that job because they're responsible for helping form the team and shape the team and lead the team. But in reality, if a, if a leader doesn't bring around them really great talent with the right values, you're never going to get anything done. Look at the great organizations that, that do well now. Um, so I think we should not spend our time looking for the great man or great woman who's smarter, braver, stronger than all of us. We should look for somebody who builds teams and who brings teams together and then who harnesses teams. Now, I do want the person who leads our nation to have values. I want them to inspire me. I want them to make me stand a little taller, feel a little braver when I'm scared, be a little more generous when I might not want to be, uh, be willing to do things in our nation and in the world that may seem inconvenient to me, may seem uh, something I don't want to do in the moment, but after I do them, I go, you know, I, that was the right thing to do. And, and so I want that from our leader. I want that from our leadership. And so I want to look in the mirror and make sure that I'm willing to demand that of the people who lead me, the people that I either vote for or support. And I think I want to be able to look at everybody else and know that we are all, with our very different perspectives, we are all having that same conversation. General, to that point, as you look at future presidential candidates, do you think it's important or valuable or even necessary in the future for a candidate, be it you know, a, a lady or a man, to name their team in advance? Do you think it's important to know if I'm gonna vote for you as president, here at least are some members of your team, because it's, you know, it's, it's been a rare process for candidates to do that. I think our current president may hinted at some of that, but what's your view on that? Yeah, I think we're now in an era where that would make sense. And I think that I'm not sure that the person should name a cabinet and put all the, the names against jobs and whatnot. But what I would want to do is that leader should have a group of people who very publicly stand up and say, yes, I have agreed to be part of this team for at least two years, four years, whatever. Um, I have committed myself that if that individual is elected, I'm going to come into government, whatever cost it has for me, and I'm going to serve. That would make me feel much better about the person and, and people that we're bringing into government because I think I'd have a wider view. 
General, final couple questions. Uh, what did your military career, you know, three decades plus, teach you about being a leader, a nimble leader in an ever-changing environment? I mean, I don't think I even recognize the U.S. electorate from even three years ago. It's, it's you know, fairly unrecognizable, and I imagine it'll be more so in the coming two years. What has your journey taught you about you know, staying convicted to your principles, your values, but also being flexible enough to move with you know, uh, continually uncertain changing times? Yeah, I, one of the things I learned earlier in my career but was reinforced is the people on the ground close to the problem understand it best. Your sergeants and your corporals and whatnot, they have a better view of it than you do, so you have to listen and empower them. The, the second thing was really uh, represented most by my experience in Iraq for five years. We were purpose built this counterterrorist force for a, a certain kind of problem. And so we went in wanting to run those plays. It turned out that the problem was very different than we expected. The environment was different and those plays didn't work like they had or we expected them to. So we had to change ourselves dramatically. Now that's a lesson in humility because if you get to 30 years in the military and you you know, tried to be a great general. You're supposed to get on the battlefield and have the plan and be able to win. And I didn't have either of that. What I had was a situation I was unfamiliar with and I didn't have any kind of solution. So what we ended up doing was admitting we didn't know, opening up the organization to this very transparent collaborative approach. And the organization was able to figure it out, not me. So my my contribution was helping to shape an environment in which that could occur on a daily basis. And I became convicted that that's the way businesses and organizations and nations have got to operate now because our challenges are going to be so quickly in arising and they're going to be so different. They're going to be protean shapeshifters in every case. So there's no right answer last week that's the right answer this week. And so our ethos, our approach, everything about us has got to be, how do we approach things humbly enough to realize that we're looking at it and have to try to figure it out and then find the right solution for it? General, such an honor to be with you today. I don't know that I can recommend Patriarch's Lives <laughs> to our guests, but I can absolutely recommend your book, Leaders. We so appreciate your time today. Such a refreshing conversation to have someone with your stature and your history. My sense is we'll be seeing and hearing from you again across America. Great success to you. We appreciate your time. God, it's been my honor, and thank you. Our honor, sir. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today with the renowned author, researcher, historian, model of great leadership principles, General Stanley McChrystal. And we will see you back here next week on Leadership. Be reminded that this program is subscribed to via email, comes out every Tuesday with a blog post and a leadership tool. You can also access it on your favorite podcast channel by looking for On Leadership from Franklin Covey. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.